Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church. I got in from a run. Yes, I went for a run. <laughs> and um, this little this little thing was up, and she said she was hungry, so I made her a what? What did I make you? A case, uh, quesadilla? Yeah. Can you say quesadilla? Quesadilla. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about the Ohio State motto which is found in Matthew 19, where Jesus says, With men this is impossible, but with, what does it say? With, with, God, with God, all things, all things are possible. Are possible. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh, with God all things are possible. That's right. That's right. Do you want to sit on my, Daddy's lap? Hang on. <laughs> anyway, we're going to have to try to get this one to bed again. But with God, all things are possible. In our reading today, in day 190, we're in Joshua 11, Psalm 144, and Jeremiah 5, and Matthew 19. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New. He doesn't change. Oftentimes we see words like David blessing the Lord for teaching his fingers to war and his fingers to hands to war and his fingers to fight. We look at the children of Israel putting their enemies to the edge of the sword at God's command and we say, look at the bloodshed, look at the violence, look at how hateful God is. And then we look at Jesus and we say, look how merciful, look how loving and meek. And that's true. He is loving and meek. It's true that the Lord is also bloodthirsty. Bloodthirsty towards sin. We in our modern sensibilities and our sophistication have come to consider bloodthirstiness to be a, uh, a bad thing. Well, it is when it's bloodthirstiness uh, in our own wickedness and slaughtering the innocents and... Um, when it comes to bloodthirstiness within paganism, false idols and false sacrifices. But guess what? God demanding blood for sin is not unholy. The fact that violence exists is a direct result of sin because God hates sin. It is wrong, it is evil, and it's not defined by our own sensibilities. Just because we think something is tasty or tasteful does not make it right, and just because we find something to be um, disgusting or wrong does not necessarily make it wrong. It's the Bible, it's the Lord that decides these things. Um, so we measure ourselves not by simply our gut, we measure things by the Word of God. And certainly not by popular opinion. But the Lord, I venture to say, look at the mercy of the Lord. His mercy toward Israel when they transgressed. His mercy toward people in general over and over again. His long suffering. It's only when the, when the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the otherites in the ancient land of Canaan that would later become Israel... It's only when their iniquity became full that he put them to the edge of the sword. And it was the children of Israel that had the messianic line through which he would bring the Messiah to save the children of the entire world. That's the only reason he did it in the first place. Why? It's an unfortunate business. We brought sin into this world. God did not. We brought sin into this world, and that's why there is bloodshed. That's why he has sin to hate. Not because of himself. It's not his hatefulness. It's not his problem. It's our problem. We brought sin into the world. He does not hate us. If he hated us, he wouldn't have allowed humanity to last past Adam and Eve. We need to refocus on how Scripture works, not how our sensibilities work. So God demanding blood for sin, while we see it's unfortunate, and yes it is, we don't, 
we don't understand how necessary it is. Now, is it for us to take up the sword against whoever we want or to mistreat people? Absolutely not. So then you say, well, it's a different God now. No, no, it's not. Because meek and lowly Jesus was harder on sin than the Old Testament even was. He brought it to bear. You know, he was more strict on marriage. He said, yeah, Moses provided for your divorcement, but ideally it doesn't happen. Absolutely. Divorce isn't supposed to happen, but guess what it does? It does. You know, if somebody is going to divorce you, you can tell them, you know, over and over again, no, you're not, and by gummies, they are. Um, you can, and, and there can be all sorts of situations. Maybe it's warranted. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's been abuse. Maybe there's been fornication and cheating and all this sort of thing. We don't know. And even if, ladies and gentlemen, even if divorce has happened and it shouldn't have happened, do we cast people under the bus because of it? Is Jesus saying, up? Oh, you've been divorced. You've committed the unpardonable sin. You're disqualified. Or you're now a second-class citizen. Um, no. No. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, and that's calling Jesus the devil, rejecting him. See, that's the same as what he said, those who don't believe are condemned already in John 3. It's important for us to realize that we cannot live up to God's standard. When we see Christ saying that the law shall not pass away in one jot or tittle, it's not saying that he's expecting us to keep the law of Moses meticulously. It's saying, hey, look, here's a guy how good you have to be to earn my favor. You can't transgress once. And if you transgress once, you're out of line and you're worthy of hell. That's why the disciples said, who then could be saved? They didn't say, oh, Lord, we love your law. Thank you so much for giving your law so we can live up to your name's sake. No. <laughs> no. You think the disciples lived up to the law? Think about Peter denying him. Think about Paul killing Christians. Think about how the disciples acted and ran like little absolute cowards in the Garden of Eden. Well, I would have too. Satan showed up, possessing the betrayer, the traitor, Judas Iscariot. So don't tell me, if the apostles themselves could not keep the law, don't tell me that we have to keep the law. Now that doesn't mean we have a license to sin, no. But what is it talking about? The disciples themselves say, who then can be saved? That's just like Lydia said, Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But he says, with God, all things are possible. And how is that possible? Because the bloodlust that was upon the Gentile nations in the Old Testament is the same bloodlust that God put on Jesus. The bloodlust of a holy God, and I shouldn't say lust, the lust is not right, the bloodthirstiness, <laughs> The demand for blood for sin, the righteous bloodthirstiness of our Lord, that demand was met not by the blood of sinners or blood by the blood of sacrifices. It was made by the blood, the precious, sinless, holy blood of Jesus Christ. And because he took that upon himself, because he chose to shed his blood for you and me, we don't have to. We don't have to. That's why in this day and age we preach grace. That's why in this day and age we're not uh, talking about holy wars or, or talking about bringing the sword to, to conquer nations. Yes, we have a right to defend. Yes, we should defend. And we have. And this has all been on this side of the cross. With only within the the last 250 years. 
of when it comes to our nation. But folks, the blood, the blood demands of Jesus, of, of well, of Jesus, yes, of the Lord were put upon Jesus and were met by Jesus. He bore the wrath that was meant for us. He's the same God in the Old Testament and the New. He demanded blood the same way, and he was merciful the same way. Simultaneously, with God, all things are possible. That includes simultaneous judgment, simultaneous mercy and grace. It's amazing. Have you trusted in him? If you haven't, you will bear the penalty for your sin. If you have not trusted in Jesus Christ and in his gospel, you will be slain eternally without death in eternal torment forevermore. But if you trust in the sacrifice, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, bearing the wrath for your sin and my sin and the sin of the entire world, yes, the entire world, If you trust in him, then he will have borne yours in earnest, and you will live eternal. We love you. Have a good day.